Uh, we mustn't lose track of time. Oh, cool. yeah. <laughs> All right. So today is February 28th, uh, 2021. And we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinctionati. Our agenda today, uh, we're going to review the practical exercises. So if you have any um, thoughts or anyone who um, experienced it or tried it out, um, in addition to that, Gary proposed to pause for breath at the first hour, after the first hour, begin to uh, draw loose ends together after about an hour and a half. So we can end the meeting under two hours and to propose for an occasional meeting behind the scenes or no particular topic for things on people's minds, more personal concerns and engagement with uh, Lord Hugh especially regarding his work in welfare. Um, what do you guys, what does everyone think? Um, I'm okay. I'm okay. Good. Sounds good. Good idea. I'm along for the ride. So Um, what do you want to do here? Start with the exercises or the exercise or with, yeah, uh, but did anybody try them, try them out? And what, what did they find? <laughs> <laughs> my, my life is chaotic. I'm trying to, um, establish some order and, um, I'm just trying to remember what, um, the assignments are, but. One good improvement is that I have a new supervisor at work and he is trying to monitor our um, overtime. So I have not been working on the weekends as much as I was. So that's kind of given me a bit of breathing space, but it's still, um, I have a lot of catching up to do, the chaos in my house and uh, personal life. but. Yeah, I think trying to make space just for the exercises um, is a challenge for me, but um, that's probably typical of um, most, quote, wage slaves, unquote. Yeah, you, you should try and do them just while you're doing all the rush of life. And the aim is to to absorb, observe what, what's going on as it happens in your life. Not not necessarily to put your life on hold or anything to do the exercises, is to do it right while you're stuck in the maelstrom kind of thing. But it's uh, yeah. it's hard to it's hard to remember. It's it's really quite a gift to get to the point where you notice that you unhappy or things are not going well, um, or, or potentially when things are going really well, uh, to just notice that and then just come to your senses. And so you can, you don't want to think of it too much as a fix for your, your moods or anything, but um, it certainly can help you uh, feel differently about uh, depression or things like that, you know, basically. So, um, it's certainly after a, it is a an instant relief from from depression. Really, you you don't really need to get any kind of um, SSRI from a you know from a psych profession. You don't need Zoloft or Paxil or Prozac or anything. It, it you can give yourself your own Prozac and your own serotonin just by doing particularly the the exercise where you just basically fall still and connect to your senses. So, yeah, it's, it's not something I'm just saying as it's, it's, it's not something that you need space to actually do is it's, you know, it's kind of, it's like, it's almost like saying, well, um, my life's uh, it's too hectic for me to, you know, take a sedative. <laughs> like, oh. I know, I'm kind of a perfectionist in that and a procrastinator. So it's like, okay, things have to be perfect and smooth before I try something out. But that's precisely the opposite of what you're telling us. 
Yeah, try it on in situ. <laughs> you see, the the exercises are already designed for you to catch your breath. So it's kind of oxymoronic to say, well, I'll do them when I have breath of time. Mm. Yeah. Um, there was a, uh, a fellow I was reading some of his material quite a long time ago now. And uh, I always remember one little exercise he recommended when you're having, um, uh, well, you know, if you're depressed or having some kind of unpleasant mood or whatever. And uh, he said to, to focus your attention on it and, and sort of just ask yourself, apparently silly questions but but they do make sense he said like ask yourself well how big is this feeling and what color is it and and what shape is it and just point to it somewhere exactly where is it is it in your belly is it just like here or 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 yeah, just find the right the dead center of it, you know and then go back and tell me how big it is now and, and has the color changed or or is it is it a different shape and um you know what you find is that if you try and do that after a couple of minutes there's nothing there it's just gone away it, it, it's just that the the um you you once you become fully conscious of the the feeling um uh it it just it just fades away it just it, after a little while you find I, i'm not you think you, you at first time you do it you think you're failing the exercise because you think i can't find it and and, and i don't know what color it is because i don't know where it is and i can't point to where it is i can't find it anymore and, and then you suddenly realize that oh yeah that's right it's just not even there um but it, it was funny it was only really yesterday thinking about that I've never really understood what people mean when they say to um, uh, really go into your feelings and experience them fully or really own your emotions and all that kind of thing. They always seem to be rather woolly statements that never meant, meant much to me. But then I just suddenly realised that it was ex really saying exactly what, what that fellow's exercise was. Um, the same thing, but I hadn't really clicked how to put it together. So, yeah, you see, a lot of these kind of emotions are fixed action patterns. They're just really repetitious behavior. And we seem to, you know, the West is so individualistic. We have this hyper individualism. And we give a lot of importance to our feelings. And now we've got a whole cancel culture that's based on not hurting somebody's feelings. And it's, you know, why does your right right to speak, free speech trump somebody else's feelings? You know, all this kind of statement is that feelings have become very, very important in our, in our culture as we become more and more domesticated. And the self-esteem movement got going, particularly in America in, in the late 80s. But what happens with these things is they don't stand up to observation. They just kind of exist because of self-reinforcement. So, for example, they are a lot like a dog chasing its own tail. Now, if a dog chases its own tail, you, if you've ever seen one of those mad, mad ass dogs that gets into habit of chasing its own tail, you can see what it's doing. It's basically it forgets that it's its tail. It has this thing in its brain, which obviously says, hey, there's a moving thing like a ball or something to catch. So at some stage, out of the corner of its eye, it's caught sight of its own tail and made some kind of false assumption like, hey, that's an interesting thing to go after. But here you have this concept of a thing to go after. And here you have the reality that it's the own bloody dog's tail. So it would be a much healthier dog if it went after a ball or a cat or a bird or something. But because it's gone, it's fixated on its own tail, it's gone into this feedback loop. And so it's chasing this nice thing to chase, which is a completely abstract concept that's really supposed to be associated with birds and cats and stuff. And it's fixated on something entirely inappropriate, and that's its own tail. 
but spends an enormous amount of time going round and round chasing this figment of its imagination. Now, we do the same thing. We come to the same kind of fantasy that say, you know, we're not worthy or our life's a failure or something like that is a kind of a concept that we've caught out of the corner of our eye and we keep on pursuing it and we come back to it like we're chasing our own tail. And every time we come back to it and, and chase it, we're reinforcing that pattern till eventually you start liking it. It starts, eventually the dog, the dog gets some kind of entertainment and some kind of stimulus out of chasing its own tail. And then we get the same kind of thing out of chasing this circular thought that I'm an imposter or I'm not worthy or I'm a failure or even sometimes even positive things like I'm a success. <clears throat> so, but it's generally negative and we keep on reinforcing this loop. Now, what these exercises do is break that relationship. It's saying to the dog, in effect, that <coughs> saying, uh, where is this nice thing to chase? And the dog focuses maybe on the tail, but if you take it the other way and say, you know, um, where is your tail or, you know, what is this? then you break the association between this nice thing to chase and this false attachment to what it's chasing. So the same thing applies. Is, is, is if, if you say, well, um, I'm a failure as a human being, my whole career is washed up or something like that, uh, and you get fixated on, you ask who? And you go, well, me. <laughs> but the more you examine it, the more it starts to disentangle itself and the more it starts to evolve, dissolve just like the dog suddenly noticing its tail instead of this concept of a thing to chase. <coughs> so I hope that made some sense, but the observation of it makes it fall down. And that's why all these things work. If you ask people, who, who am I? Who's asking that question? And they say, well, me. <laughs> and you say, well, well, who is this me? Ramana Maharshi said that you can basically reach enlightenment just by asking yourself, who am I? Who, who is this asking? Who is this observer? Try and chase it to its essence. <coughs> well, it is really a figment of your imagination. It's a construct. It, um, you know, everybody has this fiction that you are somebody and you have this fiction that you are this person, certain person. But it doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. And all these attributes like a successful career or an unsuccessful career and stuff, it's, those two don't actually stand up to scrutiny. But we never examine them closely enough. And so we just keep on this repetitive behavior and we get stuck in this, this rut. So all these things are designed to really knock you out of that rut. And to a certain extent, we don't wanna be knocked out of it because we get a kind of low grade satisfaction. We get kind of endorphins from reinforcing this pattern over and over. And so we have uh, this very kind of shitty high <laughs> that's, that's kind of cold comfort and kind of just keeps us hostage in this fixed action and doesn't let us break out to where we might get much more stimulus. And, so, and then you get various other aspects, like eventually we get scared of any higher stimulus than, <laughs> than what we used to, our little low-grade shitty version of reality we get. And so you get cut off and you eventually get uh, agoraphobia and you get um, all these kind of phobias of having more uh, stimulus. You basically get, you know, hermetism and all these kind of things where we want to stay in our own little shell and reinforce our own little negative thoughts. And so, yeah, the, so eventually that becomes something that we, we, we're not only captivated by and incarcerated with our own thoughts, but we actively don't want to get out of them because they're kind of low-grade comfort. But people try all sorts of unrealistic things to get out of them. A lot of the things with people cutting themselves and even body modifications um, like tattoos and, um, you know, body piercings, all of these kind of things, uh, all self-flagellation that all these Jesuits and stuff used to do and some, some, some Christian sects and stuff still do. They all really uh, to try and get you out of this, you know, to try and break you out of the dog chasing its tail kind of thing. It's kind of like, um, you know, if you 
if you whack the dog when it's chasing its tail, it will it'll shock it out of its behavior. And so it's kind of uh, one part of our brain trying to shock the rest of our, our brain out of the circular behavior. So yeah, if you want another exercise, I think for sure you've got enough. But is to have a look at those circling <laughs> thoughts and imaginings. Um, and whenever you see them, is then do the very first exercise, which is really the most important exercise, and that's the one where you just fall still, hear what's in you know in your hearing, feel your weight on the chair, or even if you're walking, you can feel your weight in your feet as you walk. But just just you know quickly fall still and come to the idea of an embodied kind of awareness of yourself and and connect to all those senses: taste, hearing feeling just the air on your skin, clothes on your skin, you know, that, that kind of thing, all five senses, and just be connected to those without thinking. And, and give it a go, because after a while you start to get some reward, you know, in terms of hormones and dopamine, I think, in particular, and it becomes nicer and nicer, and your world expands. <laughs> And I think that the whole point of it is really, you know, if you say that philosophy of life is the ripeness is all, is that is a way you get ripe. If you're a dog chasing its tail the whole time or you're stuck in the morbid thoughts or uh, you're depressed, you really are living a very small world, which seems like a waste of a life, right? It seems like you want a bigger world uh, to have more meaning to it. But anyway, though, what, do, you, what yeah. do people think? I, I really I agree. Um, I think for since I learned about doomerism and the state of the climate, I've gotten into a phase of depression, and I'll admit, yeah, depression and sadness. And I've always thought I, there has to be a way to break out of this. This isn't um, this. I mean, in my mind, it's not the final. It didn't feel like it should be the final, like the final curtain, and then as I learn more about your work and, and even these techniques, uh, I've been, there's been some chinks in those depression. Um, I've been, it's kind of, li it's liberating in a way, um, all those techniques, uh, especially the, uh, just getting in tune with the senses. And I think I'm starting to, it's starting to hit me now. Um, and the the thing that's that I'm realizing that's important is is mutual aid. And um, I used to be, for whatever reason, afraid of reaching out to people. But um, like you said, it's been uh, uh, I guess expansion of your mind. And I think I I'm starting to see that and expanding to actually ch at least reach out, even though some some groups may not respond back. I found the urge to to reach out to other groups and yeah, I'm just going to go from there. Yeah. So, so I'm starting to see what you're saying. Oh yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. I really like the sound of that. Cause I mean, if you, if you just miss a social interaction or something, that's, you know, your high, entire primate brain is being deprived <laughs> and you know, the same with the mammalian brain and your reptilian brain and stuff is, is, all of them need their due. You can't, um, you know, we, we live in a society where they're so dominated by the alien cortex and each layer suppresses the lower layers to a large extent. On a daily basis, they kind of keep the lid on the lower layers. So we eventually get to the alien cortex, which keeps the lid on the whole stack. And it, it really makes for a very dead existence. And even to the point where people who are very dominated by the alien cortex, they talk in a monotone. And the reason is there's no color and flavor to their emotions. They All the rest of those layers are, are really semi-dormant. And you just have this furious activity that basically all the glucose in their brain is being eaten up by this tiny little layer on the top. Now, if you have such a little stimulus to your brain, you can't really uh, um, actually be anything other than depressed because depression really is in low activity. It's an anhedonia in the rest of the brain. And so it's only by doing these things for real, like mutual aid and stuff, 
uh, it's a mistake to do mutual aid and stuff from an uh, alien cortex point of view to say, I'm going to change the world, so I'm going to do it. Like, do it for its own sake. It's, it's just, you know, it can be anything. It doesn't really have to be for a noble goal. It doesn't have to be to save the planet. Um, it, it can just be for, for its own sake. And it's it's tremendously um, expanding to, to just do something for other people. Um, it's it's like having a new limb almost. It's it's like having a new brain layer, um, and so, and and it's been so taken from us by this cult of the individual, and and particularly Darwinism. That's really why I made the Darwin series is is to try and make people to see otherwise. <laughs> from, the, from like the Darwinism is just pure poison, and and I do believe it's wrong. It's basically it's not backed up by scientific evidence. So it's not a fight for survival and survival of the fittest. It's all about feedback and reinforcement. So if you take something like a mutual aid group, that is a focal point of attraction, just like you know the fractal theory of evolution, right? It's basically based on on these um, locus of you know focuses of attraction and repulsion. Well, a group of people doing mutual aid is a strong uh, attractor especially for our primate brains and our mammalian brains. And if, even if it's intellectually stimulating, it can be an attractor for your alien cortex. So those are an, an attractor. Then the next thing is feedback. So it's not survival of the fittest. What's really making and driving humans and evolution and life, is, as I think, is, is reinforcement. So mutual aid is self-reinforcing. It's just, you know, we've, we've abstracted human interaction into the dollar. So everything is mediated by dollars and middlemen. And so the dollars are self-reinforcing. That's why capitalism doesn't work. That's why Bezos and all these guys are getting richer. It's called a Matthew effect because in the Bible, Matthew said the rich always get richer. And that's, you know, the easiest way to make a million bucks is to have a million bucks. If you give me a million bucks, I'll make it into 10 million easy. If you give me 10 bucks, it's really, really hard to make it to $100. But if you give me a billion dollars, I can make it a hundred billion dollars falling off a log. It's as easy as pie. But so the reason is that dollars make dollars. That's a feedback loop. And what that feedback loop is, we've abstracted human relations, which should be done on a face-to-face -face level in a mutual group. But if you start doing those mutual interactions and you start interacting that way, you have a Matthew effect right there in a social setting. That's um, it's removed the intermediary of having a dollar between you and your fellow person, and so it encourages uh, you know solidarity, mutual support, and a, a bigger feeling, a feeling of an expanded ego that's at least the size of all the people you know, at least at Dunbar's number of worth of them, about you know, 150 to 250 people, and but and then and it's a big threat to the system. It's it's it isn't. An act of rebellion in itself, because it means that you you're finding uh, a a source of uh, of rejuvenation that's outside the the economy, the dollar based economy, and it's finding a new economy. It's find it's uh, reestablishing social connections and human connections, and all of those are very threatening to the system because if people unite outside of the basically the Leviathan, if you if basically if you're not in tune with the ant colony, and in essence you're making private ant colonies, that's a threat to the major ant colony. And so then it's it is an act of, of rebellion. Um, so yeah, good from so many angles. But anyway, what what did people think of what I just said? Yeah it's, uh, it's uh, great stuff um the only thing i add is um it, it took me a while to even understand the detriments of individualism as portrayed by the american um system the american way of life um just your videos on the darwin video um, on darwin and also uh, adam curtis's videos helped me understand that uh it's not the way to go. I mean, individualism's toxic, and yeah, it's toxic for the individual. Oh, yeah, yeah, and for the bigger society. So it it, it is this idea of uh, you know if we all compete, 
then the best emerges. But it's really uh, exploitative and it's really a power game. And what they're really doing is, is dividing a prison yard. So if, if all the people in the prison yard uh, work together with solidarity, they can easily undermine the prison. They put the prison at risk. But if you can make all the prisoners, you know, divide and conquer, if you can make them all atomic, um, they can never get cohesion. You can always single them out. Um, basically, you can never... Uh, yeah, it's the whole thing about Spartacus, you know, that famous thing in the that scene in the movie Spartacus where they try and single out Spartacus so they can cut the head off the rebellious beast. And, you know, they say, well, you're all going to be killed unless you cough up Spartacus. And, Sp and so they say, stand up Spartacus, and Spartacus stands up and says, I'm Spartacus. And then the person next to him stands up and says, I'm Spartacus. And they all stand up and say, I'm Spartacus. And what that does is defeat the Romans because they can't really cut off the heads of all the slaves. They can't really defeat all the ants. They can only do it by singling them out. So if they all stand together in solidarity, they're finished. But it's very, very hard for, for the ants to keep solidarity. Um, they always board away. And so it's another part of the of that was the in the Matrix movie. You remember that in the first Matrix movie, the guy was was bought <laughs> you know, by 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 crap in the Matrix. They said, you know, he said, I just want to forget the, the real world. I just want to live in the Matrix. You know, I just want to taste steak and champagne. Give me a nice life. And I said, okay, that's fine. Just sell out, <laughs> sell out the truth uh, about the Matrix. And that is, the, that is the problem, is most people will sell out. And so the, the most dangerous people the, since the beginning of the revolution, uh, since cities first started, was the middle class. It's the liberals. Because they always sell out for small chains. They'll always sell out for a steak <laughs> and a glass of wine. And a, a shitty life by any standards, but a reasonable life. So it's, it's the prison mentality, and the worst of the prisoners will say, well, we won't break down the prison, or we, and we won't go against the prison system. We, we just want better barracks in the prison. So we, you know, just give us a nicer cell than the rest, and, and we'll, we're with the program. And so that's, that's the, since time immemorial, uh, the bourgeois, the middle class, the liberals and stuff, they have been the, th the threat to the revolution because they always held the system together. They always, it's basically the house slaves always kept the plantation together. They ratted on what the field slaves were doing. They sold out all the rebellions. So no rebellion can bring down the plantation system while the house slaves are intermediary between the two. But what, what's happening now is and this is why it's important from the point of view of uh, social change and rebellion is that the middle class is, is disappearing. What COVID will do is, is yeah, this inequality. Everybody says we must reduce inequality. It's like bullshit. <laughs> we want tons more inequality because inequality can end the system. It's basically while these, these guys come in like Biden and stuff and prop up the middle class and, you know, it's, it's, that uh, it reinforces this rotten system, which you can say, well, I like this system. Well, I say, well, it hasn't got much longer to go. If you carry on with this system, is the Earth's habitat, human habitat is going to disappear. So there's, there's, we're not, it's unsustainable. So, so it's better off that we have masses of inequality. And when there's no middle class left, then there'll be a rebellion. So it's, all these these feelers that you're putting out to mutual aid and stuff, they they are the future. <laughs> uh, and Biden and solar panels and the Green New Deal is the past. So it's it's it, they, the the conservatives are trying to turn the clock back to the 1950s when America was, you know, manufacturing, and it's. It's a complete misunderstanding of the financial system and why America was great in the 50s, which was you know, due to the war in Bretton Woods. And uh, on, that's on the conservative side. And then on the, the democratic side, uh, they're trying to turn back the clock, uh, you know, to 
uh, the, you know, always somewhere around Roosevelt's on the Green New Deal, or so, uh, somewhere, something like that. They're trying to turn back uh, the clock to, uh, well, I mean, Biden has turned back the clock to Obama. <laughs> it's like, and you can't, all of these people are retrograde. So looking forward to the future is this, what you're doing is important in terms of, um, you know, what's, what's a smart strategy for the future and just a smart strategy for being human. And as soon as you start doing that, you, you get through doomerism because part of what doomerism is, 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 um, is uh, stuck. It's basically a stalemate. It's basically you reach a point of helplessness where you just look at the state of the planet and everything and it's like, what the fuck do you do? <laughs> it's just, uh, but it's a good stage. It's do I keep on, posting doomerous stuff and stuff because it's very good for destroying people's ego. What people need to do is to get uh, beyond this thing where they can, you know, it's, it's part of ego to think that you can do something for the planet. So this whole thing about being vegan and, you know, personal choices, lifestyle choices, activism and exile, all of them are delusions. They're absolutely fucking mad ass delusions. And the delusion is that we actually mount a pile of beans as individuals, whereas none of us do. And so our ego and, you know, the system reinforces the fact that you're very important, which you're not. The 7.8 billion people that are super important, I don't think so. I think there's zero people that are important. And so uh, it's a conceit and it's the source of eventually, it doesn't really work, A, because you know, you can be an activist for all you like, you're not going to make a dent. And then uh, as you realize you're not going to make a dent, it makes you depressed because you're saying, I'm ineffectual and stuff. Now people think, well, what do I do? Well, well, it's great. It's great. It's what you really want. But you need to feel more depressed. <laughs> you, you need to reform. You need to be so hopeless that you crack. And then you're getting somewhere. But unfortunately, there's so many people that are out there like Michael E. Mann and stuff to say like, no, there's hope and, you know, come back from the brink and we'll make solar panels and we'll make a fix and stuff. And you're saying like, you're wasting time. You're wasting valuable time doing that because we need to get to a point where everybody cracks. And what's cracking is the ego and the alien cortex. So part of the reason why... Vaccine, vaccines are bad and all these geoengineering, solar radiation management, all these things are bad because they're reinforcing this, this ego that has no future. And so as soon as people reach absolute hope, hopelessness, then they're getting somewhere. But unfortunately, we're doing the exact opposite. We're trying to stoke hope and stuff. And the reason is it's part of the slave narratives. Slaves don't work unless you keep their morale up. So you want to slam their morale down until people are, until basically the slave can't get out of bed. When the slave can't get out of bed, then the slave plantation is at risk. And if the slave plantation is at risk, then we have a chance of getting freedom. But until that idea gets out there, basically, if if we just as a group manage to do anything, it would be to plant the seed in people that that you know hopelessness is good. It's hope is toxic. It's evil. Anybody that comes up with anything hopeful is like smash him down. <laughs> and yeah, and, uh, yeah. well, that, that's what I think. What do, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, there there has to be. It's sad to say, but um, people's emotion they have to kind of get broken down before they can. It, I'm starting to see the the importance of that. Um, you know, Rome had to fall so other civil um, groups can thrive again. Big thing like things have to fall so new things can grow. I think that's that's important. Yeah, that's an important thing you raised there, because if you go back to all these uh, civilizations, right to the very first city-state like Sumer, when Sumer fell, uh, the, all the barbarians swooped in. They don't even, they don't really know who, who they were, but they came from the hills above Mesopotamia. And um, they it's all the same story as when 
empires get weak, then the barbarians um, start swooping in from everywhere. And they seem to come out of the woodwork and kind of take their revenge. Now, a common theme throughout history for the last 7,000 years has been that it's history is written by the alien cortex, is written by the victors, and is written by civilization. So whenever civilization falls, all the all the clerics and the scribes and all the apparatus and bureaucracy, that all disappears. And so they automatically say, well, that's a bad thing because the home team is having trouble. <laughs> but if you look beyond that and you have a look at the lives of all these barbarians and stuff, you actually see, no, they're actually superior. That most people had more freedom. That uh, Things actually got load better. There were no slaves. That all these things which don't fit with our narrative that civilization is wonderful and the dark age is awful. Now when people go and look at the dark ages and say, hang on a minute, this was only dark if you were like a monk or a king or <laughs> all the bad guys. So all the bad guys get swept off the stage because the bad guys write the history. They say it's a bloody awful time. And it's like, oh, it's the dark ages and anarchy and stuff. But if you go and have a look, a lot of the people... Uh, the, one of the things that's really telling is that anybody that has the choice between civilization or going over to the barbarians invariably goes to the barbarians. It's a great source of disappointment for civilized people that savages are not interested in civilization. In fact, they hightail it uh, as soon as they can. And then that even goes to like Darwin. Darwin uh, brought three guys from uh, Patagonia back on the Beagle. And they civilized the guys and they, um, you know, they brought them up in English society and taught them table manners and how to, how to eat. And then they, they took them back to, um, to Terra del Fiego and to try and get them to, like, civilize the rest. They thought they would seed them with civilization. And they came back a few years. Darwin was devastated to find that they'd all to native again, they didn't, <laughs> they got rid of all their fine clothes and all their Christianity and so they couldn't ditch it fast enough. And Darwin and stuff thought it was a tragedy that, you know, civilization is so hard to keep a hold of, but it never occurs to these cretins that, that basically civilization is not that hot because everybody ditches it as soon as they can. <laughs> so it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. But it's interesting that you, you say that is, you see, that's the narrative that we're going through now. A lot of the reasons why people are depressed is because they're siding with the wrong team. They're deciding with the civilization and the team that has no hope of, of coming through. So then they look at everything through the wrong side of the lens. And so they, they start to see like, you know, 10 cities going up in Los Angeles and stuff like that. And they think this is terrible and all the statistics that the less jobs and you see all this decline. And then they take that as, you know, this is really bad news. And you say like, no, it isn't. You should be celebrating. This is like the <laughs> Auschwitz is crumbling in front of your eyes. What do you, you should be celebrating every stone that comes down, every statistic that looks bad. So, so, but nobody does. They all, they all side with with the slave masters. And you say you're a slave. Why, why do you, why do you lament the end of the plantation? There, there is. To be fair, there is a lot to lament in the end of the plantation. But it's kind of that's the kind of the advanced course. So that, that I mean, civilization is really some, something quite amazing. I mean. I mean, I, I have to, uh, I mentioned this to Gary, I got a, I got a mere culpa for myself that I absolutely adore civilization. <laughs> Although I spend all my time anti, being anti sermon stuff secretly, I, I love engineering and I love civilization. I love all these things. But it, they all tempered with the fact that they're all rather toxic and terminal. So I, I kind of, uh, you know, I feel like I'm a recovering engineer, you know, I feel like an alcoholic. <laughs> but, the, you know, civilization is the best drug you can, you can have, you know. Um, but it's, you still, like a drug addict, lament its passing. So, and the same with uh, civilization itself. So if you think of, uh, particularly, it comes across in a movie, like uh, Gone with the Wind which is, it's hard, it's not really accessible now to 
to Americans because it's too politically incorrect. And this, maybe you in the South, you can see it a bit. But what Gone with the Wind is saying is, is those plantations are a wonderful way of life. And you say, yeah, wonderful for plantation owners. And you say, yeah, even the slaves have a, have a place that they're going to lose in, in, you know, with freedom. They're going to become peons and get even worse off after, after the, the end of the movie. Um, but, you know, the, the plantation system and that you can't just do what liberals do today and just say, oh, it's just evil and it was exploitative. And you say, yeah, it was all that. But there is a kind of, everybody likes going into a manor house that's wonderful and have, you know, see a ball and uh, dance and to the music and have all that romance and stuff. So you you can't be too harsh on civilization, <laughs> really. The, you have to, in quieter moments, temper the fact that it, I mean, it, it's fucking batshit crazy from stem to stern. I mean, going to the moon is batshit crazy. But you have to admit that it was fucking wonderful <laughs> at the same time. I mean, it's it's complete horseshit. And we, we need to get rid of it. But it's not to say that, you know, secretly, although I would go to my grave swearing otherwise, um, yeah, going to the moon might have been human's high point, but don't, don't ever ask me to quote that. <laughs> I think that perhaps, you know, I'm just guessing, part of um, the depression that some people feel is precisely the going away and grieving for civilization. Uh, just, you know, like a hot bath, um, um, you know, Netflix, although I don't watch Netflix, but, you know, all the, all the things that we have now, they're slowly going away. Maybe not slowly, maybe suddenly they'll be gone. We wake up and a lot of it's gone. So part of the depression could be just lamenting the the passing of what all these things that are really not sustainable. Yeah, and and the thing is to not try and suppress that uh, that grief because you know I mean it's not quite like you won't have a hot bath again and stuff. Is is you you can easily have a hot bath it's just not, not <laughs> yes. the same right i mean it, um you see the the tendency is we have loss aversion as as humans we we tend to notice what we lose and not be you know there's a two to one i believe two to one it sounds about right but there's a yeah there's a two to one um discounting that we have psychologically for loss aversion so it's it's uh, it's literally a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. That to 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 recover something that you take for granted now, or um, barely even recognize that that you have it in civilization now, if you lose that, you need at least twice that to make up for for it out of new things. So that so that that means that we're going to grieve what we what we lose. Um, one of the shitty things is you lose it as an individual. So you lose your high paying job and you lose it. So you don't, nobody has, or you really get the sense of collective loss. So for example, like in South Africa, a lot of milestones are gone. Um, and uh, as, as you pass them collectively, the whole nation passes them collectively, they'll never come back. So, for example, we've just passed one now. Almost certainly we've passed a milestone with this pandemic where you can just travel around the world with ease and have vacation. I mean, just with Brexit, we've passed a place where, where Brits can have summer holidays in Spain carelessly, um, you know, have a stag party in Istanbul or in um, in Prague or something. Is is Those have, have passed. And now when people lose their jobs or downgrade to a job or something like that, their income deteriorates or they get on hard times. They take that all personally and only really have the solidarity of saying, no, we're all in it together. It's all a bit of a shit time. And so generally we have to take these knocks personally one after another as personal failings when they're not, they're systemic. 
So that's uh, one thing. And the other thing is that we don't notice the gains. So if you wind up in a 10 city, you just lament the fact that you lost your apartment. <laughs> you don't um, you don't celebrate all the stuff that you might have in that tent. And that's basically you've, you, you have better parties on a Saturday night. You, you, you might have easy access to sex and drugs, or you might have basically, you might have free time. So you see, it's very easy to get into a situation where you think like I'm unemployed and um, you know, now my life is shitty because I don't have a job. And you say, yeah, but look at your free time. <laughs> you, you know what you can do with that free time? So, yes, that's a very good perspective um, to just not focus on the losses, but look at the gains. And maybe the gains, uh, are there. You're, they put you in a better place than where you were. <laughs> yeah, well, well think, think of it from the guys um, in Terra del Fiego that got dropped off by Darwin. Then. Like, so if... If you think, you know, they go back to, they think, well, economically speaking, they're really going down market. They're, you know, going from like a manor house to a grass hut. Now, you know, th think carefully. It's probably a good exercise to think if you were taken out of a manor house and put in a grass hut, you would think, well, I've lost hot baths. I've, I've lost you know, being able to go to the kitchen and get, I've lost a fridge. Um, I've lost a place to just cook and stuff. And then it's now think how hard it is to notice what you've gained in a grass hut. Uh, because, you know, for, for starters, you don't notice the, a lot of subtle, subtle things like, you know, your health that probably improves markedly <laughs> if you can't go to a fridge. Um, you you spend a lot of time uh, of time walking and going you know outdoors and interacting with nature and you get a lot closer to nature, um, but all of those things can pass you by it, just because you color them uh, with the fact that you've now uh, suffered a loss instead of a gain. But it, it's entirely psychological. There's no reason to say like, well. I used to be in the manor house. Now I'm free. I don't have to clean it. I, I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to insure it. I don't have to license it. I don't have to pay taxes. Basically, it's a, suddenly they all start stacking up. That's so, right. There's so much overhead to being the lord of the manor. So much stress to keep things going, juggling. Yeah, th think of it. Everybody wants to be like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Uh, I mean, I've... I, I, I've had times in my life where I've been relatively rich, and I tell you, it's it's a drug because it's very stimulating when you you know in business and stuff. But as for your quality of life, basically those guys are doing shit things all the time. They that is people are putting things in front of them that uh, you know legal documents, and they have to sign, and they all the time they're talking about shitty stuff. Shitty stuff. It's basically you know beating this guy dealing with that, crooking on this. It's all basically crookery. So it's, it's like playing chess the whole time, and they're in the alien cortex. So you can, you, you know, it's, it's like being on cocaine for a while because it's stimulating like playing a game of chess. But it's also very shitty to play chess all the time. <laughs> You'd be better off, like, chilling out and not playing chess and reading a book and <laughs> swimming in the sea, you know, stuff like that. So... Uh, those guys never get to do that. If if you're Jeff Bezos, you never really get to just dabble your feet in the water. Um, you know, when, whenever you do it, it's it's on the way somewhere. It's with a bodyguard. It's with some guy trying to talk to you, talk business to you. Your time's never your own, um, and it's so everybody wants to be the king, but as soon as they are the king, their life is shitty. And so it's you know it's it's kind of good to think like. You know, I'm no longer the king, but man, being a pauper has got its upsides, especially if you know both. Actually, all of this, by the way, is covered quite well in uh, King Lear. Very good to read King Lear again. <laughs> um, here I was thinking ab about a, uh, I wish I could remember who it was. Very good talk. The fellow was talking about uh modern civilization and uh 
one of the factors of collapse being that as you create this increasingly complex structure, um, more and more of your energy and time needs to go into simply the maintenance of what you have already created and uphold, you know, whether physically or in, in other ways. And, uh, you know, he was just putting forward the idea that, that a, after a certain point, you've created such an amazing, uh, you know, complexity, um, but it's just uh, you, you, you're really stuck because you, you, most of your energy has just got to feed back into trying to keep it um, in order. You know, you, you reach a stage where you can't move ahead, where you don't have the time or, or energy or, or resources to, to try anything new. It's just being absorbed in feeding back into trying to keep what you've got. Um, because it's grown, it's 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 a. I, I was thinking of what you said about the manor house, you know, where where you're completely tied up with all the, the extraneous things to do with it. Um, but the other thing I was thinking of too, when you were talking about the grass hut, was back at the video you posted about Coronation Park in in um, in South Africa, and. Uh, um, which is a, um, you know, a, a camp, a, essentially a, a camp for um, poverty-stricken white people um, in, um, in South Africa. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the, the thing that we were talking about regarding that at the time was how even though those people were in unpleasant circumstances, the impression you got from them and from the place was that it was much real, that much realer, that they seem to be living more authentic human existences than than uh, than than the you know the surrounding so-called civilization. Um, and so yeah, they'd lost as you were, I guess as you were saying, you you lose a lot on one side, but then when you look at what what is there in place of that, which might not be immediately obvious. But, you know, they had their time. They had, a you know, a, a, a sort of a community where people knew each other um, and there was none of the pretension of competition and all this kind of thing going on, you know. So it was an a, a, um, interesting example, I guess, of what you were saying. Yeah, one of the things that makes it difficult to go down in the world, especially if you like those people in Coronation Park, is that, is that you don't have a tradition. Um, so you're cut off from your tradition, you see. Um, for example, take those people in Coronation Park. They could quite easily be gypsies. Then they would be, or you've got to call them Roman people all these days but politically correct. So, yeah, so it, they could quite easily be Roma people. And then they would have all the traditions of gypsies and they would have the folk music, they would have uh, even folk dress at one stage. And so there's a long tradition that makes them identify with that kind of camp life. And then it's something highly desirable and they wouldn't, it's kind of romantic. But they're living exactly like the guys in Coronation Park. The difficulty for the guys in Coronation Park is they came from uh, Dutch uh, Calvinists and uh, English imperialist um, upbringing. So that's a you know a narrative of it's a hero narrative of you know champions and superior race and uh, yeah, very much alien cortex, and so they've they've betrayed their tradition because they cut off from that tradition according to that tradition they complete failures now you see the difference is that you know it's all in your in your mind you'd be living the same life if you're a gypsy or you know a, a, a poor white uh, in coronation park it's just the poor whites feel dreadful about it because they have this different ideal and the gypsies feel great about it because it's their heritage and the you know they're getting all these tribal and cultural emotions 
So what it implies is that if we are headed that way and a lot more people are headed for difficulty, in other words, civilization is coming apart at the seams, uh, then you know we want to invent new traditions. And so cults and things are not bad. From that point of view, uh, you will see cults appear and you will see people developing uh, new traditions and you will see vast re resistance to it. So we've already seen it. We, we've seen it before our eyes, but nobody can really interpret it. Nobody is, can, is really acknowledging it, but we saw it with a capital right. The capital right is, is a new tribe. It has its own shaman. It basically has its own uh, conspiracy theories, which are traditions. That, the conspiracy theories of QAnon are not any, I mean, they're relatively sane compared to, say, the San Bushmen. The San Bushmen have some fucking wacky <laughs> theories about life and stuff. I mean, I'll just give you one of them, for example, that throughout history, the history of our species, we are brilliant at coming up with bullshit. <laughs> and so, for example, the San Bushmen have uh, what they call star fever. And what they think the stars are not very far away and they occasionally fall off the firmament and fall down to earth. When they fall down to earth, they're little glowing balls about yay big, about the size of a badger, and they go running around on the ground. <laughs> if you happen to tread on one or touch one accidentally, you get very, very sick. And they call that star fever. <laughs> mm. like, what the fuck? But anyway, all indigenous people have all these weird fucking beliefs. It's just part and Yeah. Look, but the thing is, um, it doesn't matter what their story is. It's just got to be a coherent story. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. We only yeah. crave an explanation. It doesn't matter if it's bullshit, as long what? as it's a, a, a... Like, I remember one day I was with my mother, and she's got a very strange psychology. She's kind of not dumb, but she can be, I don't know, seem remarkably childlike for some reason. And uh, she's not well educated. And we were sitting in the car looking at the waves coming to the shore. And she, or the tide was coming in, that's right. We could see the tide gradually moving up the, the shore. She, she said, oh, what, you know, what causes that? Why, does the, why do the tides come in? And, so I, I just sat there doing the beautiful thing, explaining about um, you know the moon and the sun and the and and all and water sloshing around and all the, and she was just falling asleep. And I said, "You don't like it, do you?" And she, you know, it just wasn't working. So I just invented a bullshit story. And even though she knew I was inventing a bullshit story about water gods playing around out there and creating tides and all the rest of it at the same time that's what she wanted was a, she wanted a a, a a story that was sort of engaging and that you could imagine stuff and and brought it all alive um and it didn't matter it just didn't matter you know uh at all but she's she's absolutely right it, it's yeah. our culture that's wrong you see if you look at the QAnon conspiracies then you know all these liberals say like, but this is bullshit. It's quite, it's quite obviously wrong. And you say, well, our culture is all alien cortex. And it has this conceded belief that there is a right story, that there are facts and you can have debunkings and, you know, and there is this objective truth. And basically it's held by people that are experts and people that go to college know the difference between right and wrong and truth and fiction and stuff. And you say, no, that's all your fucked up star fever version of the, of the universe it's entirely unwarranted and i can you don't have to go very far to show i mean i show you a scientific paper that says over half of scientific papers are wrong i mean not not you know slightly wrong conclusions are wrong they they're wrong fundamentally from method from basically the basics of of, of science they are, are wrong so the majority of science papers are bullshit you, you know they're in it blighten but you can't tell that to a liberal. It's like, that's, these are experts and these are science. But objectively, by uh, reviews of them have shown that all science is junk. I mean, literally, all science is junk. Very rare you do get a paper that isn't horseshit. But, but you know, it, it, why it kind of works is the, the 
the horse shit accumulates and you know it, it there's a kind of weeding process so it kind of works but it's you know it's, it's like the way we think of it is like uh, a study shows that blah 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 and there's like oh right that's the truth now and it's no it was two fucking undergraduates who don't know their fucking ass from the elbows but we don't you know in our story we, we science is the font of truth and stuff and then no that's just our myth it's e conspiracy theories are not wrong uh, any more than than uh, science theories so QAnon and so what the, what they're doing is correct from your grandmother's point of view because it's it, you know the science view is pure alien cortex and it says it just appeals to the intellect and it's all black and white and very dry and unappealing and that's our explanation of tides but if you say it's you know something quite romantic and you explain it in terms of say myth and legends and so Greek versions of why the ties happen you engaging the reptilian brain and the mammalian brain and say of course it's far more true it's the lights are going on in a lot more places than if you would explain this thin dry layer the, to the alien cortex so there's a there's a bigger truth than just this simple alien cortex this dry black and white truth which is is every bit uh, a construction and a fiction than uh, any other batch of crazy myth or stuff that now we dismiss. It might as well be a dream. So it, it doesn't have any more merit than anything else. But you can't tell that to to liberals and uh, you know today. It's it's if, if, because they don't be, they they believe that what they're doing is beyond belief. And it has something to do with science. And it's like, no, it isn't. I mean, just in my Darwin videos, I can show you that Darwin's religion. But no one will believe you because it's like, it's not religion, it's science. That's like bullshit. It's all religion. So um, yeah, it's a very difficult sell to the to average people because we think we've actually got somewhere. And then it horrifies people that, oh, you know, how are these people so backward? Uh, you know, basically the, the capital riders, how can they possibly be so backward? And say, well, no, I mean, the, uh, they're doing what is going to happen a lot more, and that's they're starting a different culture. They're starting countercultures. And so they, their counterculture narrative is far more advanced than it is on the left. So I worry about the left is going to struggle during collapse a lot more. So although you think of the left as hippies all going to form a commune and they're all going to do permaculture, ah, no, that's not the way this works. It's basically you, you're going to do permaculture like you're going to like grow weed in somebody else's turf in a tent city. That's how your permaculture is going to go. Unless you can offend your, your permaculture with a gun, you, go, you basically, uh, I don't think the hippies are going to shape in this. So, yeah, that's, that's a little narrative waiting for a crash and burn. Uh, as well, I think the right and the preppers and stuff, the the libertarians, they're actually more more in advance uh, in in terms of of collapse um, and and collapse resilience, which will blow the mind of a lot of people on the left to think they're green and they're thinking in terms of community and you're just like, nah, nah, you're not really. It's kind of fake. It's this kind of fake little narrative that really is based on. Uh, you know, basically liberal privilege. But when all that liberal privilege crashes, I mean, look, I, I let it cut straight to the chase. You know, you're not going to be doing Kerry Shermany permaculture and regenerative culture when you're in Coronation Park. So the guys in Coronation Park are a lot more in tune with the capital rioters than they are with, you know, solar panels and social justice and stuff like that. So, so I think the, the left needs to get over that silly narrative and get onto a genuine, uh, you know, resilience narrative. What? And I'll say one more thing. I'm sorry to bore you to tears here, but the, the Jim Bendel and the deep adaptation guys. What? Those those kind of narratives for adaptation. I think are they 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 genuinely alarm me because I think those guys are heading for a big hurt, and the hurt that they're doing is without them realizing it, they are doing a cult narrative. But they're doing the cult narrative that I keep on posting again and again out of frustration that I don't think people are hearing what I'm saying. Is that if you look at that solar cult thing that I posted, if you look at the the uh, Heaven's Gate, uh, Jonestown, Dev Chris, they all have the same uh, thing. It's, it's just they're almost identical. 
they have they have this uh, utopian idealism um, uh, very closely in, interlinked. What happen? They have a, a leader like Jan Bendel, and it's all carry, sherry, sugary spice. And then what happens is eventually that leader gets cancer. What well, happened with Marshall Applewhite? And happened with the, the guy, um, the, both guys who led the, the solar temple, was they eventually get terminally ill. Now, what they've done with those cults is they have an ego boundary that's as big as those cults. So when they personally are dying, they take the whole cult with them. They basically, they have a, the reason why they all commit suicide is so that they die with the master. It's kind of like the pharaohs, they get all the pharaoh slaves are buried with the pharaoh when they die. It's the same with Indians doing sati is, is you know, the Hindus think of their wife as part of themselves. So they think I'm dying. Well, it's not right that part of myself survives. I must take my wife with me, and that's Sati. She jumps on the fire. It's the same like the terracotta army in in, um, in China. Is that when you get a big enough emperor who like represents the entire nation, when the emperor dies, he says like, "Well, my ego is the size of this nation, so it is. You know, it's it's like Louis the Fourteenth, uh, le tat c'est moi." basically says, I am the state. So, so the emperor dies and he's saying like, I am China. Therefore, when I die, China dies. So all you guys basically get in the, get in the pit with me. And I think what happened with the terracotta army, the guys had some get out clothes and they said, ah, can we do a little symbolic, you know, just, we'll, we'll just symbolically be with you in heart and spirit. We'll make a little terracotta image of ourselves and bury that. Is that okay? Uh, and the emperor probably went, Ah, oh, fuck it. Okay, I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> but that, and I think that's what happened with the Terracotta Army. But in essence, you you get the will, you get the the dynamic, and that's basically when the leader is where the leader goes, and it's 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 part of um, you know QAnon is where where we go, one we go all, and it's really things where the leader goes, we go. So we live and die with the leader, and that's not a very good way to go because you know humans are mortal and those guys are going to peg out at some stage and they're going to take everybody with them so so yeah go and join deep, deep adaptation xr is also has shows signs of being on that path but go and join them if you want if if your ideal in collapse is to go out with phenobarbital around the campfire singing kumbaya believing horseshit go for it that, that you that's the path that you're on but I feel that there's another way to get a cult uh, and, and with if you have enough awareness to say we're not doing that version. <laughs> we, we're doing the version where maybe we might squeak through on this, right? So, yeah, that's, that's my thinking on, that, uh, on the whole topic of, uh, of mythology and creating the myth. Yeah. We, we well, should... We should just stop for a minute. Yeah, yeah, we must. Yeah. Feel, feel your fingers and toes and notice your breath and that kind of thing for a moment. Yeah, and, actually, um, let, me, let me lead you through it. And so, so, so just, just sit, sort of like balanced and erect, and just, just feel your spine. Straight. So, um, and yeah, close close your eyes. Just imagine you could be being kind of pulled up from the crown of your head by by a thread. So imagine that you know you're hanging like that. But so so your stomach muscles are, are roughly um, semi tightened. Not you don't want to kind of be slouching. Um, and so you must feel that your thorax is kind of raised, and just put your palms flat on your thighs, and then just. <sighs> Or still, just um, immediately just be conscious of your face and make sure that your face is not tense in any way. So particularly around your eyes and your eyebrows, just release the tension without squinting or making a fuss. Just just let, let that tension go. And the rest of your face and your jaw, just let that, that tension go. Let the tension go around your neck. Don't exercise or do anything. Just, just be aware of the tension. Just let it go.
Okay, but come away of your breath. But don't change your breathing. Now see behind your eyes. Just look behind your eyelids. Focus your attention there without squinting. Just relax, feel deeply relaxed. Be conscious of your hearing. Go out to the most distant sound. Let the sound come to you. Don't let your attention wander out. Be aware of your taste. The weight on the chair, your feet on the floor, the weight of your hands and shoulders. Go back to your neck and face and make sure there's no tension. Just release it. And fall deeply still. And rest with the sight behind your eyelids. If you can see that kind of a halo, then just keep watching it and relax in that sight. Okay. How about that? <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, in the, in the uh, cult I was in, the, and I think, yeah, I think it's kind of a tradition. They uh, they would always say uh, at that point, like, Om Paramatmane Nama Iti. That means uh, Om in the name of that supreme Atman, it's done. Some of it's not done for you, it's done for uh, that supreme Atman. That, the personal self, the universal self, not not for you. You see, the, the difference is that in all the self-help gurus and stuff like that, are they people are doing all of this for themselves. They, it's all their ego trip, and it's kind of to break that ego trip. Yeah. That was that was the general idea. Yeah. All righty. So uh, yeah, any other questions? How how How's this going, by the way? <laughs> um, I have a comment um, regarding the Manor House and everything. I remember last year some stores, they went out of business, like Models and Lord and & Taylor. And I'm like, okay, so they went out of business. There's too many stores anyway. So, you know, you don't need how many stores do you need. You need a variety, but, you know. And, and also... Um, you know, it, it's a transition to other things like uh, it might cause people to look at other sources of like local food and things like that. You know, the I think the industrial food system needs to end. So those kind of things might shock people into doing, you know, looking at other sources of food. I like I like to think that at least some people in Texas and stuff must have taken the option to think, you know, like uh, maybe you know, industrialized food system is not such a good idea. Yeah, the, the the governments all over the world, if the governments know, I think, that, that we're heading for a brick wall, and one of the things they should really be doing is, um, you know, making food more resilient, trust, doing the opposite of what they're doing now, and that's uh, deconstructing the, the big food companies and uh, Monster and Sanito and all that, those guy, kind of guys, is is the in, they're thinking more and more in terms of an industrial uh, food system and, and closing down small farmers. And they should be thinking the other way of trying to, uh, you know, encourage agriculture and small holdings and farms um, and reverse the trend, which is hugely... It's hugely gone the wrong way. They're, all, they're only 3%. I think 3% of Americans now work in agriculture. And as recently as the war, I think that over 50% were working in agriculture. And so, um, here, that, yeah. um, that video of uh, Russell Brand a few days ago, you know, talking about the Indian farmers. Uh, and effectively, that's what's happening there, heading in the wrong direction. You know, where, where they're all small landholders um, 
and you know they're going to end up being bought out and controlled by the corporations so they you know they they if they could maintain their system they might have a hope but they're in the process of breaking it down yeah indian farmers is a very sad uh situation so i went there in like 2007 and i went to some farms and the farms i went to were in a communist uh region and they were having a riot when i was there and a lot of demonstrations like demonstrations in india are like millions of people because people have a lot of people to get and so they were very dramatic uh looking um but what the rights were about was uh about the about tractors so what the government was trying to do was to trying trying to give them loans for tractors and get tractors in because they wanted to make farming more efficient and why they were rioting is because they uh the communist party insisted that farms are are tilled by hand and the reason is there there's so many people that you know farm by hand and they put out a work by a tractor so then what what happens is the government wants to get more revenue so they want the farms to be more efficient so then they basically you know give loans so the farmer can get a tractor but all these other people that work on the land are suddenly displaced and so you have you know hundreds of people displaced by one tractor you know maybe 500 people by one tractor and so what those 500 people are supposed to do is then go and get into the industrial economy and so it's it drives them into urbanization. So they, they've driven off the land. The land becomes kind of like a Western farm where you have these vast, um, vast areas just, you know, uh, done by mechanized agriculture, just by combined harvesters that run on their own. They're tracked by satellites and, um, you know, very few people involved. It's highly mechanized, highly chemical, and, and it's efficient for a while. But it means you in, suddenly the farmers have to borrow lots uh, to get the tractor. They have to borrow to get the petrochemicals and fertilizers. The soil is is fucked up entirely because you you go from a system where you all the, all these guys are driving oxen and cows, you know, basically across the fields and using dung. They use that dung as fuel, and they use it as fertilizer. Now, as soon as you get a, tr a tractor, all those cows are, I don't know, they don't eat them, but they, 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 I guess they just transport them to the West so they, so they can get processed in a meat factory. But you can see the way it goes. Uh, is basically then you have all these people that are reliant on a tractor, agrochemicals, uh, industrial stuff, and that's where Bill Gates is trying to send it. And all and all these people wind up in a city, and then everybody says, "Well, that's good because you know cities are greener." It's all horseshit because if people survive in a city, they're either in part of the slums, in the growing number of slums, which is where most people wind up, or if they successfully in, industrialize them, then they uh, they wind up being consumers, and they start flying around and start getting you know incredible luxurious tastes that the, the planet can't um, sustain. So the whole idea is that you turn America, the world into America. And uh, America is unsustainable. The, the whole world is feeding America. And it was all done by Bretton Woods and the you know dollar he hegemony. And now uh, China is trying to overtake that place. So the, the planet is going to crack as China goes from having a half the per capita yeah. income of an American to try and equal and then exceed, and then tend to do it in the next 10 years. So we are fucked. We are absolutely fucked. Well, you can see it. Yeah. You can see that in that graph. I think you put the graph up showing the uh, energy consumption of Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, it was off towards the left-hand end. But if you go over to the, uh, the right hand, and so if you go to the other end and look at the massive spike for uh, China and uh, the USA in terms of their energy consumption, it's it's like, you know, if, if the next nearest, you know, like they, that was number one and number two, but by, number three was like orders of magnitude way down, you know, this huge drop off to the next one down. Um, 
you know, when you see it uh, displayed, you know, presented like that, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, but I look at that other graph with the trends in energy consumption. So everybody oh, the primary energy, yeah, yeah. Yeah, everybody does this, yeah. you know, what I call thinking in frames, and they have this uh, mm. framework where uh, we all get to transition to renewables. Well, transition has happened. It's transition, energy transition has happened, and it's over. It was a transition from coal to natural gas. But... All that's going to happen now is that coals kind of will remain steady and natural gas will increase 30% by 2030. Uh, oil will increase 30% by, in, by 2030 until it runs out. And so, so although renewables might get to 28%, they're not going to grow as fast as fossil fuel usage. And it's, it's not a matter of policy. It's not something you can go and do a banner drop about and XR can campaign about because all they're doing is making uh, Western countries offshore their energy requirements faster. That's all they're doing is turning Britain into a financial hub so that Britain can, um, you know, and America can finance uh, this carbon footprint of, of Chinese prosperity. So... You can't. You you are actually being counterproductive. In XR, you're actually being counterproductive, because you're you're hastening the demand for energy by offshoring uh, your your carbon footprint to China, and uh, so yeah, and it just gets worse as you add this new infrastructure, new windmills, new EVs and stuff, new wind turbines and PV and stuff. They're all manufactured in China, and they all go up in CO2 in the next ten years. So it's it's compounding the problem. You'll you'll never get that recover the carbon from um, a wind turbine or you know the manufacturing footprint of a of a wind turbine and stuff. So 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 we we're, we're in such deep trouble as it's it's unbelievable. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like the the governments know it. I mean, I don't think this is news to any government. Now they're faking out the population, and the population is being willingly duped. If you look at the the tone of the mainstream and the the kind of free hopium and stuff, and just and just look at it next to one of those graphs, and you know that the average yeah. mainstream media outlet is talking horseshit, and and people people are people are um, lapping it up. But we, we're back to this um, myth, mythology that we we a culture has. We are in a cult. We have a mythology, and the mythology is that all this stuff is good, civilization is good, um, and uh, and we, we're going to green it, we're going to have social justice, and nothing of the sort is going to happen. But again, yeah, it's, it, you know, what you said, Gary, about complexity, uh, things tend towards complexity because um, if you try and manage some something, uh, you have you get a two extra problems for every problem you fix. So that that's what happens to all empires. There was a theory of empires collapsing because of complexity. So if you see something like the Ottoman Empire, it we get our word from Byzantine, which means so complicated it's unworkable. And and the Ottoman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, that's the way it became. It tried to have a perfect system where you know a perfect legal system, but every every one point of clarification in the law that you got, you got two exceptions. So you need to clarify those. And then clarifying those created two other loopholes, and you had to clarify that. And eventually, you have a whole body of legislation and law and bureaucracy and military, and that's a vastly complicated. And uh, it becomes so unwieldy that it became, you know, the, the sick man of Europe, and uh, it, it collapsed, or, you know, basically... Um, Lawrence of Arabia just kicked it in because it, it was so top heavy and and that's where we've got to now in in terms of you know that's why AI and all of these things are are the opposite of a solution they're saying it's it's kind of like the Ottoman saying we'll double down on complexity and technology and then everything will be better but it's um, you know it it always works the the opposite way around, so that you don't get flying cars and leisure time and more food and stuff. You you get extra problems. You need more people managing AI. So if you have a factory that's that's robotic, you would think, well, that's fantastic. All the workers uh, can get a UBI and be sent home. And you know, um, the, the it's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. If you remember in that movie. 
uh, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, they get, at least in the last one with Johnny Depp, they, Charlie, uh, you know, all the Oompa Loompas and stuff um, get replaced by robots. And then the movie ends happily because Charlie's dad gets his job back uh, and now he's fixing robots. Well, yeah, but I mean, what about the other 999 people in the movie? They all laid off. Now, economists say, well, they go to other chocolate factories and start working. But it doesn't happen that way. It shows that, you know, what, what statistics show now is that AI just, just basically forces those guys into working harder for Uber or whatever's left in the gig economy. And so, um, yeah, for every Charlie's chocolate factory you make, it doesn't mean that now you get, you've, you've got uh, leisure time. It means that now you've got robotics, you've got the electronics, the, you know, a million more jobs in effect to support that supposedly automated factory. And economists say, that's great, jobs for everybody. But they're not really, they're shitty jobs that are getting worse and worse and the machines are doing more and more. So you're getting into this Byzantine top heavy complexity and everybody says, well, we're going to hit the te technological singularity. Well, we're sure as nuts going to do that. It's called collapse. It's basically, it becomes so top heavy that nothing fucking works. And that's, that's where we, that's where we're getting to now. If we, we've already got there, in fact, and we got there in 2008. And so what we've been seeing is the unraveling of, uh, of tech society. But I think we're not being made for it. And uh, it's not part of our narrative. I, I have a comment. Um, so with energy, um, you know, peak oil and all that, um, uh, there will probably come a time when it will be like Texas when we'll have brownouts or rolling brownouts. Do you also envision that, um, you know, the internet will go down and or maybe we will just have spotty internet or rolling internet availability? Um, which, in a way, in my mind, would be um, good in the sense that we cannot be surveilled all the time. There will be periods of outage um, when we won't be tracked and uh, we won't be so addicted to our tech because the Internet will not be available as a 100% resource for us to use. Um, I'm just wondering on how what you think will happen with internet um, connectivity. So, yeah, um, of course the internet doesn't work when there's power outage, but people will go to more and more effort to stay connected. So the, the internet is, is quite resilient. For one thing, it's really for the military. It's like the highway system. It's, it's, it's given to, to civilian use just as kind of a backhanded favor. But its primary use is military. And so you mustn't forget that the, the, they're going to keep the, the internet going to, to the last because it's, um, it's military strategic. Um, and it's, its primary use is not civilian, although all the civilians think it's all, you know, the post cap. It's not. It's, uh, yes. it's intelligence. Um, yeah, thanks for that. I remember you did um, tell us that a while back, that it was for well, military purposes. Yeah. Yeah, well, but there, there, there are a number of things where I think that where the internet will go. One of them is balkanization. So uh, the the old ideal of the hippies and Tim Berners Lee and stuff that we'll have a global internet and you know all these new kind of democratic systems and that that's that's already dead. I mean the bamboo curtain and these all all these private internets. The internet. Is, is showing too much um, uh, ability to cause uh, an insurrection. So, so you'll have these these legal um, legal barriers and all these kind of balkanized uh, internet zones. So the internet will fragment, and already has. You'll have the Chinese internet, and you'll have the Iranian and Russian, and every you know each country will control the internet more and more. It becomes more and more important for countries to be able to switch it off because after the Arab Spring, it played such a big part in the Arab Spring, and they they couldn't switch the internet off, and so the Arab Spring really ran on social media. They've since stopped that. I mean, you saw how controlled it was in COVID. How they can. 
they how they have control of the information and you know pretty well that uh, you know they can also uh, you know switch off uh, if there was a massive insurrection say say in the states they would sh switch the internet off very quickly and then the other thing is that the experience of the internet will get more and more shitty it will basically become more and more like interactive tv so by the time elon musk puts up some things like starlink then uh, you'll have more and more private internets. But those internets are not part of the universal internet. They will also have, um, you know, they will shape the shape the traffic on that. They will control the content. And it, 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 we're going back to uh, 1998. So in 1997, 1998, people have this kind of lacuna where they forgot where the, where the next big thing was. And the next thing big thing was, was Microsoft and IBM and all those big guys of the day, uh, they, they were going to do interactive TV. The idea was you have all the fiber and everything, and your TV you know, has all the stuff gushing at you, and they'd give you a back channel on your TV so you could interact with your TV. And they, basically, they would control it. You would have like Comcast or whatever your, net, your uh, service provider was. They would control your entire experience. They would control all your shopping. It would be, you know, you would be entirely in a in a locked in to a network, and we're talking locked in. So you would have, you wouldn't be able to go to Amazon if you say on the Comcast network. You'd have to be on the Amazon network to to buy stuff from Amazon. That that stuff and to see shows and stuff, you'd have to be on a particular network. There there would be like uh, network TV, and and so yeah, for twenty years we got almost what. The hit piece wanted, but now they've got entirely the internet experience is entirely, um, it's entirely now interactive TV. Uh, if you look at YouTube and stuff, all the censorship there is just they're trying to make it a PG channel for family family viewing, and so <laughs> you know it's basically they just all will be seeking the the same profits. So you'll have low loads of choices of shit basically 99 channels 99 flavors of internet and stuff all on <laughs> and, uh, and so and and then and then people will increasingly you know have battery backup and generate and stuff so that they will won't have heating in their house but they will have internet <laughs> so that it, it becomes you know just like people would have, would go to accept the trouble to have radios and stuff and emergency protection the internet is the new Radio network. So, so we're not, we can't get away from the internet. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then 5G and all of those stuff, they just integrated more and more and more in, into our lives. You know, there were, there, there's a French, uh, this French cult, they were basically kind of deep, uh, deep green resistance types. And they, they, uh, started doing their own permaculture stuff, and the the French police they raided and arrested them all. And the very in court, they said the very first thing that tipped them off, that started their surveillance, was the guy start stopped using cell phones. That that was the trigger to where the state started monitoring them closely. So that that was almost ten years ago. Oh so boy. So yeah, you, you there's no escape from this. Bas basically, you it's very hard now to to exist without internet connection. I mean, just just managing anything, just just the bureaucracy of the state is is run through the internet. A lot of taxes and stuff you need to do to to go online, you know. So yeah, the the internet is it's one of the last things to go. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> but the experience is going to get shitty. It's going to be it's the the days of guys like me putting up videos and stuff uh, can't last much longer. You know, I mean they'll last, but I mean like very small audience. Like from 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 my audience on YouTube, you know, I, some some of those videos I did with with um, McPherson and stuff, they got you know in the like six or seven thousand views uh, now i get about 200 views because the algorithms they, they don't even notify people that are subscribed and stuff they just they just would if you look at kevin on you know black bear news and stuff 
He's down to a few hundred. He used to have thousands of views. Down to a few hundred, just because uh, the algorithms are cutting it out. So they don't. They don't want a, a democratic internet. Um, it's 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 a very very powerful tool, and it, broadcast media always was powerful. Right right from the beginning of print. The, it, if you go and look at the Gutenberg printing press. When the Gutenberg printing press started, there were thousands of printing presses, and it was like the internet. Everybody was suddenly publishing. There was a revolution, or literally, a revolution. <laughs> based on there, are a lot of people say uh, trace the you know the uh, the revolts and stuff that happened in Europe to the printing press, and certainly the Calvinist revolution. All of that came from print. so there was a time when everybody had a printing press and everybody was using. And then they shut them all down. They started licensing, licensing printing. They made it harder and harder to print. Till eventually, you know, to have a print newspaper, you would have to be somebody like Murdoch, and it all got consolidated. So the internet will go the same way. Yeah, it's life. <laughs> life in the alien cortex. Yeah. That's the way they. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just thinking back. Uh, over a few years it uh, you know I used to be able to just put it look down the uh, list of recommended videos on YouTube every day and find something really interesting to look at and uh, now it like if I go to YouTube or something I, I don't even waste my time looking down the, I don't scroll it at all because I already know there's going to be nothing there it doesn't matter how many channels you subscribe to how many times you might listen to some other interesting things they just don't recommend anything worthwhile it's not there you know it's, yeah. uh, they yeah. don't just completely it, they've emasculated the, the entire thing yeah that was always their plan so it, it's amazing really that the internet lasted for 20 years but it's over now yeah but yeah i mean you we can still do stuff like this right you can still doing conference calls and stuff so there is oh yeah call, but i mean everything option. is everything is uh is uh isolated like as is, is if you don't already know that it's there you it's you're never going to find it you, you you know it's it's remarkable how specific your search might have to be and how persistent you would have to be to to find uh something and even then, you've got to you've got to be assuming that it's there to find in the first place. You know, you could say supposing somebody's got a particular take on things and that they've done videos. How would I search for that? You know. Um, uh, so, so one thing they they will struggle to do is to manage things uh, like conspiracy theories and countercultural movements. So, if you have an ecosystem of like-minded people like us. That's very hard for them to control. So if you don't try and go for the big numbers, if you go for the big numbers, they'll try and quash you. But if you you see, imagine something like the Falun Gong in China. Uh, you can get a mass movement, a mass cultural movement, and and they find it very hard um, to to suppress it. And in fact. The more they suppress it, the more attractive it becomes. It, it, it's like the early Christians. Is if it's an underground culture, cultural movement, it's attractive for that reason alone, because people that are disaffected with the status quo and they are just going to grow in numbers uh, are looking for some alternative. And so they, there again, the left needs to catch up. The right wing it, are ahead of the game in terms of. Internet countercultural movement, and the the left is not. They're still too full of ego. They still have their heads up their ass, and so uh, pl things like XR are very authoritarian, and they not they don't have the feeling of um, a popular countercultural movement. They have a feeling of you know a cointel op. So the left is not doing well. On that, it's it's you know kind of cancel culture and all of these things. They're not really a countercultural movement. So the, I, they don't have an identity, um, and they don't uh, have much of a philosophy. It's very thin, thin philosophy. So uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of scope for 
cults and countercultural movements. I think they're going to be lots. In fact, you would expect that um, as as things from fragment, secret societies, all of that stuff. So it's it's it, so again coming full circle back to what we've lost and what we've gained. Although we've lost the Tim Berners Lee free inter internet and the hippie ideal of a unified world, well, we've what we are gaining is the exciting Elizabethan world of <laughs> undercurrents and secret society. It's far more exciting, far more exciting than a unified world. It's, uh, I, I, would, I would much rather have the world of Klaus Schwab and the Great Reset uh, being attacked by secret societies <laughs> than I would have you know, a global kumbaya, we all friends together sorting out the planet. Uh, it's, I think it's a lot more exciting and adventurous to, <laughs> to, to have a countercultural movement and a, a rebellion. You know, rebellions are really fun. If you want meaning to life, they really are fun. But you have to have a kind of a, a Tintin, you know, sense of adventure. You know, Tintin and the Great Collapse. <laughs> kind of yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, Hugh, did you want to? Do you want to touch on the other topic? of your um your position or, or do you want to leave that because we it's a bit late now do you want to do that next How time much or, longer or, do people want to go it's like it's uh 10 minutes off two hours i think oh are. shit yeah. well so yeah maybe we should round it off <laughs> that's too long yeah maybe just leave it at that and try to talk about your your uh, situation next week do you want to do that or yeah. So, so yeah. Um, or, okay. Just, just, just lay it out there so we know what to talk about next time. Uh, basically, um, uh, Hugh and I were having some conversations, um, and uh, well, I mean, for anyone who's watched his video, particularly go back and watch. Uh, what is it, number thirty-two? I think um, where you explained that. That you know you were employed for a while, and uh, and then uh, you ended up living on on your savings, um, and uh, of course you've turned out an enormous body of work in terms of the the videos and the the book and uh, other writings, as well as uh, keeping the um, the uh, Reddit and Discord going. Um, uh, but um you know the practicality of life is that that, that Hugh is is likely to need some employment to uh, just to survive like everybody else and uh we were just discussing you know what strategies or what what might be uh, available to uh i i think basically i could probably speak for all of us in say, saying that we we would like Hugh to be able to devote his time entirely to what he's doing at the moment um because of the, the you know the inherent value in it so uh it was basically to put the question out there if anyone's got suggestions or want to help in any way to uh this is probably a good time to be coming forward um to to say something or do something um there were it, i mean we talked about the possibility of monetizing some of his videos <clears throat> but more or less i guess the conversation we've just been having is going to indicate that that's probably not going to be massively profitable turnout i guess um so um but yeah i think it's going to be worthwhile to bring this up every now and then to keep people reminded in, um, yeah i i um i do have to give some attention to monetizing a bit of what i'm doing because um uh if i want to carry on doing it it's I, i've got to have a source of income i'm not uh i i'm just living off fixed assets and they they're not going to last much longer but um i think what i'll do is i'll start putting videos and stuff uh, behind a paywall on Patreon and stuff and see how that goes. But um, what my dream has always been is um, uh, I, I would like more people to get involved 
so that we could all make money out of the project. <laughs> I didn't really ever see it as a project for making me money. But I, I, w I would really like it if, I mean, I have dozens of ideas for things for people to do, but I would like it if we could all uh, support ourselves out of, you know, uh, the org and stuff in particular. So, yeah, I think we should. Well, the thing is, maybe, the, yeah, maybe we're going to have to, uh, because unless it's, if it's not talked about here and it's not talked about on Reddit or Discord, nobody's, nobody's knows about it. So we'll, you know, uh, maybe devote, you know, every second, third, however many meetings entirely or, or mostly to that kind of thing so that those ideas are getting discussed. Um, otherwise, if it's just a one-off thing or there's no particular forum for presenting it, it just doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, I mean, if we are doing a movement, the movements do run on cash. That's the reality of the world we live in. So even if you anti-money, you still need it to live in this society. Uh, so, but yeah, I would really like to explore the idea of us all, you know, making money. Because I've always thought you can, you can do activism, um, you know, do really personal development and make money and do infotainment for people all, all in one. Um, I think it's it, it can be an ecosystem that generates money for us uh, to live on, and I would I would I would like to to expand that. See if anybody's interested. Um, but potentially, yeah, potentially, it would be really nice if we could all live through the collapse on a growing ecosystem of of basically adaptation so one of the ways is of adapting is finding new sources of income i i can always just go back to being a, a wage slave or at least i hope i can always thought i could but <laughs> i might be educated on that school um but uh yeah um but it, it what would really uh, appeal to me, and uh, I think it would be really exciting is if, if we could all explore it together. If we, I would really like it if we could have a an ecosystem that, you know, we explore collapse adaptation and we use it as a vehicle to find ways where we can all live on it during collapse too. That would be really exciting, I think. Um, so yeah, and, uh, and yeah. Fun. Well, I mean, that this is where actually uh, you sort of started that discussion in the book. Really, I, I guess it touched on this a little bit, and yeah, um, you know, yeah, maybe I, I did suggest that kind of thing in the arc, but I I, I didn't uh, flesh it out enough or pursue it enough. But uh, yeah since I think maybe that's in the next next Sunday, we should start discussing it. But I, w yeah. I would really like to know from people if if they would really like to have an income stream from this. And I mean, you know, to the point where you can actually survive off it. Mm. That in great luxury, <laughs> but, but in kind of like, you know, uh, Sam Mitchell type of luxury that's <laughs> yeah. 500 a, week, a month or something if you can, if you yeah. can live on a small change but yeah nobody the way our our society is structured it's just, it's structured so that you uh, you you can only live by suffering and if you do if you do what you enjoy basically there's considered no no payment <laughs> So it's very, very hard to make a, um, you know, a living off movies and writing and creative arts and stuff. But I think we could if we did, if we did, um, did it in the form of a game. It's always back to the thing that that uh, the Institute movie where I originally got the idea for the the game, uh, or or at least crystallized that it for me. And you know, I always thought that 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 it was an artwork and I, I always thought you could have monetized that and keep it growing organically. And I thought that would be a really cool thing. But I, 
Is any, you know, does anybody else see this vision or care? Well, um, it's it's the how and um, what skills we can or you know I personally can contribute. I mean, if there's a list of skills that I can apply for, kind of like to slot into a plan, yeah, I'd be willing to, you know, to help out. But it's 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 the not knowing what skills are needed. Um, I think it's more the other way around. We should take the skill set that we've got, and because the Nag is so open ended, okay, you can do anything. So, so it's it's more like come up with stuff you would like to do, and we'll find a way, work together to make a way that you can do it. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, way it's the other way around. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm liking the idea, um, definitely. It's something we can grow. And uh, I agree, um, we each have our own, well, whatever we'd like to do, like some skills. Um, yeah, we can definitely contribute. And um, it's good, it's kind of reminding me of mutual aid. It's kind of like the same concept where we're reaching out to each other, we're reaching out to community to, to survive or kind of thrive on our own apart from the system, yeah. Yeah, I, and hopefully this, uh, I hate to use the word synergy, but there, hopefully there's some synergy. So like like Divine Beast is doing artwork and stuff like that. So we could, I imagine you can start collaborating. So instead of just doing artwork that you try and sell as an individual, is, is you collaborate and we do like a graphic novel or something like that. And, you know, just seems to me that it would be kind of exciting thing to do. But but anyway, I uh, the Gary's point was I do have to start thinking in terms of monetizing a bit of what I do, so it's just you know putting stuff behind paywalls and stuff in in my next videos, you know. And anyway, the next videos we're gonna be on Christian bashing, so I might be, get booted off YouTube anyway for that. <laughs> I, will, I uh, might work better behind a paywall and Patreon. <laughs> so, oh, have you considered Rockfin? That's where um, Blackberry yeah. News is trend, uh, not transitioning, but they also have an alternate channel. I yeah, I Rockfin. signed up for it. I signed up for, it, but I didn't put any videos up there yet. Yeah, I yeah, I think I got approved. They, you got to sign up and put a website and stuff, so they kind of yeah. they do have to approve you. But I, I think they sent me an email saying I was approved, so I might I could I could uh, yeah yeah I, th I think um, Kevin's getting most of his traffic now from Rockfin, more traffic than YouTube. Yeah. So okay, well that's cool. Well, anything else? Anybody else should we wrap it up though? That's two hours, I think. Yeah, um, cool. yeah. Cool. Cause it's that's a lot. You've covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thanks for that, Hugh. That was great. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Thanks for bringing yeah. that up. But all let's right. let's discuss more about the. Yeah, movie. maybe. Um, yeah. You, you know, just set aside. Well, maybe what we did just now, the last part of the meeting or the first part of it or something every time to uh, to just sort of build up a, a picture, I guess, um, because yeah. uh, I'm feeling fairly blank about it. But, you know, um, after a while, it sort of might develop. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right then, we, we we call it a night or a morning, yeah. wherever you are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye okay. then. Okay. All right. All right. All right. See you later. All right. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.